The history of the Cheka and NKVD knows many examples of how swindlers and bandits became generals and order bearers. Among them is Naftali Frinkel, a merchant, bandit and cruel builder of communism, who developed a system using huge masses of prisoners to create roads, dams, hydroelectric power stations and artificial reservoirs. Alexander Sojenitsyn described Frenkel in his book The Gulag Archipelago. He had his own steamships and he even published his own newspaper, Kopeka, in Mariupol, with the task of discrediting and poisoning competitors. During the First World War, Frenkel conducted some kind of arms speculation through Gallipoli. In 1916, he smelled a thunderstorm in Russia. Even before the February Revolution, he transferred his capital to Turkey, and after that in 1917, he left for Constantinople. During the years of the net, he comes to the USSR and here on a secret instruction from the OGPU. He creates as if on his own behalf a black market exchange for buying up valuables and gold for Soviet paper rubles. Dealers and brokers remember him well from the old days. Trust him and the gold flows into the OGPU. The buying ends and in gratitude the OGPU puts him in jail. And so on one far from perfect night for Frenkel and his friends, an encrypted train arrived in Odessa with a detachment of Moscow Czechists under the command of Terenti Derabas. Frenkel and most of the leadership of the Odessa OGPU were arrested that same night and taken to Moscow under heavy guard. On February 12, 1924, he wrote a letter to the Collegium of the OGPU by the decision of the board of January 14, 1924, I was sentenced to a 10-year sentence in Solovki. In view of the fact that I have twice suffered a tuberculosis process and that my lungs are in a very bad condition, the climate of Solovki and malaria will ruin me in a short time. In view of the foregoing, I ask you to allow me to serve my sentence in some concentration camp in Moscow, appointing a medical commission to examine me. With my help, I need not only a good climate, but also a dry room and a special personal regimen, especially if you take into account the length of the sentence. That's it, and not otherwise. Nathalie Aronovich Frankel, a prisoner in the Buterka prison. The camps existed before Frankel, but they had not yet taken on that final and unified form that smacks of perfection. Every true prophet comes just when he is most needed. In the very first days after his arrival at the Solovki special camp, with the help of a bride, he got a job as a contractor. An epidemic of typhus began and was developing with unusual rapidity on the island. Urgent measures had to be taken to eliminate the dangerous disease. The sanitary service advised the camp administration to urgently build bathhouses. The engineers drew up plans and estimates and estimated the construction period. 10 to 20 days. Frankel understood that this was his chance. On his own initiative, he planned a large bath with a construction period of 24 hours. To do this, he demanded that 50 people be allocated to him and two other conditions. He selects people himself, and hot food and alcohol must be provided at the appointed time. Having received a go-ahead from his superiors, Naftali Frenkel walked through the barracks. Here he selected 30 Kronstadt sailors and 20 old men from the disabled barracks. He brought them to the construction site where the minus 25 degree frost was fierce. He put the workers in two lines, sailors in one, disabled people in another. In 24 hours, we have to build a bathhouse here. If we don't make it in time, then you and me and them, Frankel pointed at the old people with his finger, will be shot against the wall. Hot food will be brought here and a glass of alcohol. And now we begin. The prisoners set to work. Frankel clearly led the process. They built in all directions. The walls were not yet fully erected, but bathing boilers were already being installed. The roofing was started and a stove and dryer were placed inside. The work was completed three hours ahead of schedule. After that, the life of the newly minted prisoner changed. How exactly Frankel transformed himself from prisoner to camp commando is mysterious. The story goes that when he arrived at the camp, he found shocking disorganization and waste of resources, both human and material. He promptly wrote a precise description of what exactly was wrong with every one of the camp's industries including forestry, farming and brick making. He placed the letter in the prisoner's complaints box where it was sent as a curiosity to Jenrik Yagoda, the secret police bureaucrat who eventually became leader of the NKVD.
It is said that Yagoda immediately demanded to meet with the letter's author. Frankel himself claimed that he was whisked off to Moscow to discuss his ideas with Joseph Stalin and Lazar Kaganovich, one of Stalin's closest associates. Again, the truth is unclear. Records show that Frankel met Stalin in the 1930s and was protected by Stalin during the years of the Great Purges. However, no record has been found of any meeting in the 1920s. Almost a year later, on May 4th, 1927, Camp Admin, Theodor Zeman, submits a new report. Taking into account the exceptionally hard work and good behavior of the prisoner Frankel Naftali Aronovich, convicted in November 1923 for 10 years, I petition for his early release. At present, the prisoner Frankel is acting as the head of the Operational and Commercial Department of USLON. In May last year, his term of imprisonment was reduced to five years. Petition for the release of the prisoner Frankel is also prompted by the fact that the use of a prisoner in such a responsible position is inconvenient for many reasons, which I have repeatedly been instructed, in particular by the prosecutor of the Supreme Court of the USSR, Comrade Krasikov, who also spoke out for his release. By a resolution of the Collegium of the OGPU, dated May 16, 1927, Frankel was released ahead of schedule. In 1928, the governments of the United States and Great Britain decided not to buy construction timber from the USSR, citing the fact that lumberjack prisoners on the Solovetsky Islands were dying in mass at their workplace in the forest. A number of European countries and the Socialist International addressed the government of the Soviet Union with a request regarding the state of affairs in Soviet concentration camps. Then the Soviet leadership decided to invite a commission of foreign representatives to Solovki to check on the affairs in the camp. In 1929, the commission arrived on the islands, which included Maxim Gorky. They were shown everything in, in perfect order and cleanliness. Camp departments, a children's labor colony, a punishment cell, a library, two camp theaters, and a an anti-religious museum. One boy told Gorky about the torture, about the horror that was happening in the forest. However, after returning to Moscow in 1930 in a magazine entitled Our Achievements, he published an enthusiastic essay in which he would say that Solovki is almost an earthly paradise. Frankel made hard labor profitable. By 1929, he reorganized the camp administration itself. Frankel ensured that everything that did not contribute to the camp's economic productivity was discarded. All pretense of re-education was dropped. The camp's journals and newspapers were closed. The distinction between those with criminal convictions and those convicted of counter-revolutionary crimes were dropped as both groups were set to work alongside one another simply as laborers. Alexander Sojenitsyn described Franco in his book, The Gulag Archipelago. Of all those who helped devise and perfect the slave labor system of the Gulag, Special mention must be made of Naftali Aronovich Frankel. Frankel, born in Turkey in 1883, had been a prosperous merchant there, but after the Bolshevik Revolution he moved to the Soviet Union. Based in Odessa, as an agent of the state political administration, Frankel was responsible for the acquisition and confiscation of gold from the wealthier classes. The unscrupulous Frankel was unable to resist this temptation, however, and in 1923 was arrested on orders of the Moscow Central Office for skimming off too much gold for himself. Convicted of economic crimes, he was sent to the Solovetsky Special Purpose Camp, a bleak Arctic penal colony. Frankel's special talent for improving inmate work efficiency was quickly noticed by the camp officials there, and it was not long before he was ordered to explain his ideas and methods to Stalin personally. His main proposal was to link a prisoner's food ration, especially hot food, to his production, essentially substituting hunger as the main work incentive. Frankel had also observed that a prisoner's most productive work is usually done in the first three months of his captivity, after which he or she was in such a debilitated state that the output of the inmate population could be kept high only by removing the exhausted prisoners and replacing them with fresh inmates. High-level approval of Frankel's methods quickly led to the duplication of his system around the country. Then Frankel was named Chief of Construction on the White Sea Baltic Canal, the first major project of the Stalin-era Gulag and part of the first five-year plan. According to the instructions of Comrade Stalin, in the canal, 227 kilometers long, was to be built in 20 months. For comparison, the 160-kilometer Suez Canal was built in 10 years. 
and the 80 km Panama Canal took almost 30. Frankel managed the daily work. Some sources claim that during the construction of the canal, if one of the prisoners fell from exhaustion, he was immediately shot and rolled into the wet concrete, since there was no time to bury people. The canal was built in a short time, and Frankel was awarded the Order of Lenin for his diligence. Official figures say that during this brutal construction, the death toll of prisoners reached 15,000, and Alexandra Solzhenitsyn estimated up to 250,000. Stalin seems to have been so intent on creating a highly visible symbol of development that he pushed and squeezed the project in ways that only retarded the reality of development. Thus, the workers and engineers were never allowed the time, money, or equipment necessary to build a canal that would be deep enough and safe enough to carry 20th century cargoes. Consequently, the canal has never played any significant role in Soviet commerce or industry. Не готовы основные каналы и шлюзы, а до конца строительства остаются считанные дни. Отсрочки не будет. Солнце определило срок. Нужны героические усилия. Слово за вами ударили. Близится половодье. Весну мы должны встретить готовыми сооружениями или вода, которую мы захватили дамбами, загораживали перемычкой нашим врагом и сметет результаты неслыханных трудов истекшего года. Сегодня наш враг вся в воде. Based on the experience of building the White Sea Baltic Canal, on August 28, 1933, Naftali Frankel was appointed head of the Baikal Amur Correctional Labor Camp, or BAMLAG, also known as the Railway Gulag. One of the tasks assigned to the Baikal Amur Mainline or BAM is the duplication of the functions of the Trans-Siberian Railway. Due to its proximity to the territories of other states, the Trans-Siberian Railway could easily become a victim of intervention and was during the Sino-Soviet conflict of 1929. A so-called Brokadnaya, or bypass road, was needed, running parallel to a possible future front line. But the terrible year of 1937 came. Frankel's surviving enemies howled with delight when the news of his arrest spread. He was charged with spying for Turkey, France and Japan. He was even, as contemporaries testify, put in the inner prison of the Lubyanka. Frankel's case was mysteriously delayed in Moscow, seemingly by Stalin, leading the local Bamlag prosecutor to write to Chief Prosecutor Andrei Vyshinsky. I don't understand why this investigation into Frankel was placed under a special decree, or from whom this special decree has come. If we don't arrest Trotskyite diversionist spies, then whom should we be arresting? On the personal order of Beria, he was released. And not just released, he receives the title of engineer and the second order of Lenin. During the war, Naftali Frankel's department was used in multiple hotspots. During the Battle of Stalingrad, it was necessary to build a railway on the left bank of the Volga. The convicts removed the track links and bridge trusses from the barn and delivered them to the front, where they assembled an 80 kilometer railway track in 10 days. This section of new railway called the Volga Rocade played its, perhaps, decisive role in the defeat of the Germans near Stalingrad. The railway workers worked at night, unnoticed by the Germans, pumping echelons of tanks, artillery and infantry to the front from Siberia and the Far East, with factory equipment wounded and refugees flowing the other way, towards the safety of the Urals. The construction of the Volga Rokada provided the entire Battle of Stalingrad with reserves and weapons, which marked a radical turning point in the course of the war. Georgi Zhukov, Marshal of the Soviet Union. Naftali Frankel had enviable intuition and wolf instinct. Based on considerations understandable only to him, feeling the approaching purges on April 28, 1947, he resigned due to a serious illness. 